Hi everyone, welcome to the Community Classroom. This is Dr. Tracy McCarthy, psychologist, attorney, and educator. And this is a long overdue discussion that we are getting ready to have now related to slavery. And this involves child slavery from Europe to America. And by America, I mean mainland America and also the Caribbean during the period of the transatlantic slave trade. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the problem of child slavery and this involved child stealing. And so we're going to look at the problem of child stealing. We're going to identify the dynamic that was going on in terms of bringing children out of Europe into the Caribbean and into mainland America. We're going to quickly look at the attempts to regulate it and also we're going to look at the involvement of the English courts and the hospitals in this process of child stealing and enslavement and deporting the children to America and the Caribbean. And what you'll be able to see is uh, the names of the children. And so this may actually help some of you who have been stuck in terms of tracing your ancestry. You may note that because the children, their names are there, um, you may note that some of your ancestors may have similar names. And so this may be an avenue for you to go down in terms of trying to trace your ancestry. Now, just to be clear about what we are talking about, we are talking about a couple of things. One, and this is really important to make note of, we are actually talking about court ordered deportation and slavery and child stealing coming out of Europe into the Caribbean and into mainland America. If this video appears on anything other than Dr. Tracy McCarthy, it is stolen and unauthorized. Let's get started. Now, before we look at the actual names and the dynamics that were going on, we just want to talk for a minute about why this was going on and how it all transpired. And so there was a market for children during the colonial period, during the transatlantic slave trade period. And the market for children was based upon the political economy known as the pauper apprenticeship. And so you've heard people talk about indentured servitude and these indenture contracts. And so some of this was a part of this dynamic where children were quote unquote indentured and they were doing this with poor children and taking them out of Europe and bringing them into the Caribbean and into mainland America. The problem is, is that there were no actual end payments in many cases. And so there was not the normal indentured servitude dynamic going on. And then during this contracting with children, there was no one to help the children with these purported contracts. And so, as you can imagine, with children coming over unaccompanied into the Caribbean and into America, uh, they were taken advantage of. And in many instances, there was no way for them to get out of the situation, so they were enslaved for life. Now I'm free, and the world has come to see. Now, there is an article, and this is a really good article if you are inclined to look at it, and it talks about the preventative and punitive regulation in the 17th century social policy related to transporting children and other persons and basically stealing and transporting children and other persons. And so this was a very interesting dynamic that was going on in England where they were simply stealing people's children, putting them on boats boats, enslaving them, taking them to the Caribbean and taking them to the Americas, and the children had no way of uh, becoming free. While you slip, the 
Now, you do hear a lot of talk about these quote unquote bad contracts that people entered into in terms of indentured servitude. That's not what we're talking about here. We are actually talking about child stealing. And so one of the things that happened was that England did try to prevent this from happening, but there were so many dynamics going on that it was difficult for them to get a total handle on exactly what was going on. And even when they created laws and policies against it, uh, people found a way around it. And one interesting thing that was taking place was that individuals were claiming that they were confused about what was being sold. And this goes into that labor contract. And so what individuals were doing was they were saying that they were confused about whether they were buying and selling a contract or whether they were buying or selling a person. And this was very important because there were a number of dynamics that were going on in America whereby individuals were told they were being sold in terms of a labor contract in England. But when the children were in America, they were treated as chattel slavery. And so you can see uh, in the middle there where it talks about an advertisement uh, in Maryland where they were talking about the home and they were selling the estate and identified it as being stocked with servants. Well, when something is stocked with servants and then you list other chattel, it indicates that you are saying that you are selling people along with this estate. And so you have this dynamic whereby uh, the English were saying they were not clear that this was going on and that there, there were concerns about people owning and enslaving English people. There, however, was no concern about enslaving other people. Uh, but be that as it may, we're going to go ahead and look at some of the dynamics and how the children ended up in this dynamic. Now we're going to look at this dynamic of child apprentices or child slaves. And so they were identified as child apprentices, but you will see as we go through this that that is not exactly what was going on. And so this is from Christ Hospital in London from 1617 to 1778. Now, some individuals might say, oh, these were indentured servants and these were this was a part of white slavery, perhaps. However, you have to consider where the children were going. And so these children were being enslaved and sent to Jamaica, Antigua, Bermuda, Virginia. And so there is another dynamic going on here. And let's look at first these deportations to Jamaica. This is in 1744. And again, you will recall that there were things going on in Europe during the 1700s uh, related to the Jacobites and a number of revolutions that were going on. And you have this dynamic where the parents were deported and then the question of what happened to all of those children. And so you can see the names of the children. Remember, this is from the hospital. And so the children were admitted to the hospital. This was a very involved process here. So the children were in, admitted to the hospital and then another individual would take the children and then uh, have them bound out to serve someone in the Caribbean. And so you see an individual, uh, James Bernard, and in many instances, they would baptize the children first before doing all of this. It's unclear what that was all about, but that was a part of this dynamic. And so uh, this little boy was bound out to serve a Mark Hall Esquire in Jamaica. And so you would be able to trace this particular name and you might even be able to find records related to Mark Hall Esquire of Jamaica and this little boy James Bernard and you can even see they identify the name of the father in this instance then down below you see another child also bound for Jamaica and you see some other individuals involved in this transaction uh, with this child and you see the name is James James you see another child 
which is John Rose. Again, another baptismal. And you can again see uh, who is being served. And it does look like uh, there is some legal involvement in terms of lawyers involved in this whole process. Now, some people might offer that the parents were sending the children because they couldn't take care of the children and this was going to provide the children with a better life. But of course, we don't know that for sure. And so you have another situation with little John uh, up top, again, baptized. You see several individuals involved in this uh, process and then bound for St. Christopher's. And so that gives you the name of a place that this particular child was going to. Uh, you also have a, another one, Josiah Warren, and you can see a number of individuals involved in this. And apparently his aunt, Elizabeth W., uh, was involved in this particular process. And so it says was to be bound to her brother. And so this may have been a family situation, uh, but the child was to serve someone else named William Reed of Jamaica. And so you've, you've got a number of dynamics going on here. And then you have um, this identification of someone as a Chinaman of St. James Parish. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, so again, you have these names. And so these are just some of the names. Now this book is in the library and it's a reference book and it is filled with names. And so you can go through that. You can't check it out of the library, but you can use it there and you can make copies if you need to. Uh, you see another child, Nathaniel Exley. Uh, you see another child, uh, Christopher Cotterell. And uh, you see this one also may be a relative of a relative. Um, and you also see that the children are going to Jamaica, Barbados. And here you see some additional uh, situations, again, children being baptized. And then in this instance, uh, going with, sometimes I would say that there was consent. It's uh, confusing about where this consent was always coming from. It's not always clear uh, in order to send the children out. But again, you see this dynamic where several people are involved and this particular child went to New York and uh, was to serve Joseph Reed. So here you have individuals, you have a person who was being served and then you have the person who was being sent. So you have two names now that you can trace just in case you are related to the Yates. Uh, then you have Robert Bigall, Bignall and then you have Thomas Longest. And again, remember that sometimes they change these names around. So you might have this name abbreviated to Thomas Long. And again, going to Virginia and also going to Jamaica and going to New York. And here you see another one with James Swift. And this child is uh, being admitted and it says by order of the court. This is again in 1751. It's unclear why the child was ordered by the court in this particular instance, but the legal system was involved in this entire process uh, with the taking of the children and sending them uh, out of the country. And you have going to New England, you have going to Jamaica, you have going to Antigua. And here you see some additional notations and you see in one instance uh, to serve someone with the consent of his friends. And some of the notations are very odd. And so it's not clear exactly what was going on in the one instance where you see Richard Smith. You do see that there is a relationship going on. So you see his uncle Abraham Jordan to be bound to his uncle Nicholas Smith commander of a ship bound for Virginia. And so that actually may have been a positive situation for that particular child. So you don't have an, a by order of the court dynamic going on. And here you see additional names of children uh, and you see the ships that they are going on. You can see that uh, there was one going on the castle you can see one going on the Joseph children with names such as William Foster, Richard Smith, Isaac Brown. Uh, this is going on in the 1600s. 
And hopefully because these names are going back into the 1600s, this may give someone a linkage and they may be able to push past some of that blockage that they've been experiencing in terms of hitting those roadblocks with finding ancestors. And so you also have some additional children. You have going to Barbados, you have Jamaica again, Jamaica, and then you have uh, Virginia. And this again is in the 1600s. And you have names such as Riley, Porter, Anthony, and Knight. And here you see a Richard Crompton, and this is uh, the son of a fishmonger. And this particular child was admitted from St. Margaret Westminster. Now what this also means is that once you trace your family member to one of these places or these particular names, you then now have additional information because you can see that there should be records at places such as St. Margaret Westminster. Okay, so this is very important. Okay, so now we are going to look at a different source here. And this is a book that includes the early child immigrants to Virginia. This also is a reference book. But again, if you can find it at the library, you can actually use it there and make whatever copies you need or sit there and do your research, you know, and going through the different names. Okay, so what we have here are the early child immigrant list. And these are children who were deported in many instances, you're not going to see the names of the parents in this situation. And you will sometimes see the name of an adult that brought them there, but you might not see this parental dynamic going on. There is often also this notation that the children were willing to go. And so the children went to Virginia and it's not completely clear how this whole thing transpired with the children but in some instances the deportation was related to uh, juvenile delinquency so the child may have been loitering or being a vagrant uh, engaged in a little petty theft or some sort of deceit and this was used as an excuse to deport the child and so we're going to look at some of the names of these children and so you see one child with the last name Webb uh, is kept to go for Virginia. This is in 1619. And you can see this is very early during the period of settlement. And so it's very interesting. So then you see um, another child, you see uh, Catherine Williams, you see James Gardner, you see a uh, child last name Wright, Nichols, Destins, Joyner, Park. So during a time when the settlers were theoretically struggling, they were bringing in children. Now, unfortunately, the pages are slightly slanted, but this is how it was copying with the book on the uh, copy machine there. Okay, so you see another uh, listing here. You see Gardner, you see Micklewood, Beverly, Smith, uh, all going to Virginia, and they were keeping them there at different places uh, until they shipped them off to Virginia. And if you look over to the right, you see the Ludley uh, last name, and you see that uh, this child was living suspiciously uh, in Arden's Alley. And so one of the things that uh, was a crime, and in some places it's still a crime for children to loiter, uh, to be vagrant, and here you see some additional children being shipped out. And again, just make note of the dates. This is very early in terms of settling, uh, colonizing, and uh, children are being brought over. And again, this is also during the time of slavery that's going on in terms of the Atlantic. But uh, here you have a number of children that are being brought over. So it lessened the need for uh, people to come from Africa or even to enslave Indians in place. And so you see additional names, you see uh, interesting spellings here. So you see King with an E at the end, you see Jordan with a U, uh, you see Feith, you see Gailey, uh, you see Smith and Farrier. So some of these names may have been coming from 
uh, different places. Now remember, during some of these revolutions, you also had the French involved supporting some of the efforts. So you had uh, a number of names that might come up that might not seem like traditional uh, English names or Irish names or Scottish names. And here you see some additional names. You see Wakefield, Parker, Mitchell, Jacob, Blaylock. And over to the right, you see Langley. And what's interesting is, is that this child is being deported for uh, a cheating fellow, was well, cheating. And um, so, but you also see that there is a notation. They are often noting that the child is willing to go in some instances. You don't always see that notation, um, but in some instances they are indicating that the child was willing to go. And this, again, this is coming out of the court book and this is in a Bridewell and Bethlehem. And here you see some additional notations with names and you see one child is being deported for attempting to steal an apron, uh, but the child was willing to go to Virginia. And you see again several notations of child is willing to go, child is willing to go to Virginia. Now there is the question of what happened to the children of the deported Jacobites. And this is a very good question and it is a question that should be answered. This is one of the reasons that the Truth Commission is essential. There are people giving testimony now, talking about what they feel and what they think related to reparations. And many of these individuals have not done research on the totality of the situation to get a handle on what is going on and what you are trying to repair. And so there are a number of dynamics that need to be considered and they need to be considered by individuals who are getting up speaking and those individuals who are considering this. So the Congress needs to participate in its own research in trying to get a better understanding of what is going on before you even get to a commission, before you even get to discussing what type of reparation is appropriate. And so one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that you don't have the whole story and the story right now is very convoluted and you have voices coming from a variety of spaces with all of these different narratives. And even right here in America, there are uh, so many different voices telling all of these stories about what they believe happened in terms of slavery. What needs to happen is a truth commission because we need to clearly understand who the enslaved people were, where they came from, how they came to be enslaved. Are we talking about children? Are we talking about that black birding situation? Because this is what's going on here. We need to get a better handle on things. It's not a prudent idea to just jump into talking about reparations when we don't understand the totality of the harm. We don't understand how everything uh, fit in terms of the big puzzle. We don't have the big picture yet. Now, another thing that needs to be considered is this dynamic of egocentrism and ethnocentrism that is going on related to slavery. You have a number of individuals who are speaking for their small collective or their large collective about what they think in relation to what they believe happened to their ancestors. And there is an unwillingness to entertain that something else may have happened to someone else's ancestors. And so there's a lot of discounting of uh, narratives. There is a lot of uh, ethnocentrism going on. And this is informing some of these counter narratives that are going on. And we have a situation here where many people may just not want to revisit slavery. It is not necessarily the best chapter in the history of the world. It's a bad chapter in the history of the world. And it is a chapter that not only involves 
America, it involves Europe, it involves Africa, it involves Asia, and it involves a number of individuals involved in something that they had no business being involved in for economic reasons and some other reasons of depravity. And so you have individuals saying that none of their ancestors came from Africa. Well, the question is, did any of your ancestors come from Europe? Are any of your ancestors among these children? Are any of your ancestors perhaps responsible for bringing the children over? Were any of your ancestors involved in the colonizing? Were any of your ancestors involved in the blackbirding? Sometimes there is defensiveness about this dynamic because again, it's not a pretty chapter. And most people don't want to be associated with other individuals, whether you're talking about ancestors or not, that don't uh, look good in terms of the historical narrative. Now, we are also going to look at another dynamic related to how children were enslaved and in many instances enslaved from birth right here in America based upon the behaviors of their parents. And so it was a dynamic known as bastardy. And so this dynamic took place whereby children were enslaved because their parents were not married when the children were born or because the children were what was considered quote unquote mixed race. Hopefully this information helps with a better understanding of the complexity of the transatlantic slave trade and also assist you with thinking beyond what you might have been thinking in terms of looking for your ancestors. Remember, knowledge is power. Take care and see you soon.